Okay, so in this session, I'm going to talk about LaTeX. I'm going to go through a, a slideshow that I created in LaTeX a, and, and using the Beamer theme in LaTeX uh, and talk you through why we would use LaTeX and when LaTeX would use and some of the parts of the tools that we use and that I use when I'm working in LaTeX. Now, first of all, we've got here is the Overleaf um, online program. Um, and if I just remove myself down a little bit, you can see the the um, overleaf dot uh, com in the URL up here. Okay, so so this is an, uh, is the overleaf page, uh, and that's the standard page that I use for for editing um, LaTeX. Uh, and I'll just move myself back up here, uh, and you can see that this has a um, a menu system uh, over here which is, is the project that I'm currently working on. And in this case, I have my Beamer theme, um, which is in uh, a folder um, called Beamer Theme NTNU 2017. Um, and uh, you can actually see that this is also linked because we're working on a public repo that this is, is open. Um, I actually have um, under the menu, I have this linked to um, GitHub, so if this is actually a, a linked project to a GitHub repository. And so I can sync with the GitHub repository. When I make changes here, I can then sync it and push those to GitHub and bring them back. Okay, so this is so this IDE is a web-based IDE, but it uses Git as the back end and GitHub as, as a, an easy connection. You can also just use a Git in and out or connect it to Dropbox. So there are various ways to, to link the source code that is online here with an offline editing tool. Okay, so um, this, is, this is the Beamer theme. Um, rather than just present this using the standard PowerPoint style, uh, what's called Pimpress, which shows me a PDF with my notes on a second screen, um, rather than do that, what I thought I would do is I would actually show you the slides in um, overleaf because that's kind of how I edit LaTeX. So, so we thought I'd do this. Um, and one of the things I'll do is I'll also do the percent comment there. Now, I'm not sure if you guys can actually see the text large enough, so I'll just make things a little bit larger um, and put that aside. Okay, so this is the 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 LaTeX editing area, and I'll just move myself over the top corner here and make myself a wee bit smaller so hopefully you guys can see what's going on okay so here um, this is a, a LaTeX file and this is where you're actually editing this is a preview of what you're editing now uh, I actually have and um, if I'm in if I was here uh, you can see this set beamer option uh, show notes on second screen equals right. Uh, and so what I actually had here is that it has the normal slide view there, and way over here I have my notes, um, which I only had on a couple of pages just to show that they existed. Uh, now, that's not particularly useful when I'm talking to here. Uh, that's only useful in a program that I use, um, Pimpress, to do a presentation. So what I'll do is I will just use the percent comment to comment out that line. And when I hit recompile, um, it will recompile this side based on what's in the text here, right? So this is the, and now you can see that this, this window has, it ends here, there's no no extending option over, this, over the right. Okay, so that's what I've taken off. I've taken off the, the right notes. Now, that's basically how we use um, overleaf is that you are editing text here and you see the result on the right and these two buttons take you back and forth between saying okay if I'm looking at something on the right here and I go oh where's that text I can click this go to PDF go to location PDF and actually went by double clicking it took me there um, and that allows me to go from this location and you can see that it immediately updated this side to show me this frame okay so this frame is Content versus style, which is content versus style. Okay, so this is keeps keeps the the text that generates the PDF separate from the the PDF uh, and allows you to link the two together. Uh, now, so we come to the start. We actually start with a why use LaTeX to create documents at NTNU. So um, one answer to that question is 
because you're forced to by your crazy academics. Um, yes, um, once it's mandatory, we don't, we shouldn't necessarily have to explain why you should do something because we've told you to do it. Uh, that's generally not a great way of doing things. So um, what I'd like to do is actually explain some of the justifications for using LaTeX and also some of the, the nice tools that we use with LaTeX, um, particularly around computer science work. So um, content versus style. So one of the, the key things uh, around writing documents is this idea that, that we have a separation of the content of a document and the way it's presented. Okay, so that so if you think of, of app development, right? So the the iOS system has this model view controller. The idea that there's a model, and then there's a view, and then there's a controller. And so the model and the view are different things. So there's this a kind of un internal representation of all your data, and then there's a secondary thing which is how you view that data, and then third thing where you how you control the data. Now. In LaTeX, the idea is that the, the data, the stuff that you write, should be independent of exactly how it's being presented. So um, these begin itemized lists could be copy and pasted into a standard um, article for a, a journal, or they can be the bullet points on a slideshow. How the format that they're being presented in shouldn't affect the core content. The core content should say the same and merely the view should change. So so this is is one of those core principles of, of um, LaTeX is that we write and that it gives the computer information. The computer then uses that to typeset our document and make it look nice. So at the moment we're doing these slides approaches. Uh, now so uh, we don't expect you to be an expert, so LaTeX does all the formatting for you. Now, we as a, a university uh, actually have set up a style document which says how we would like a particular documents to be styled. That's how we believe it should be, which means if you want to satisfy the requirements that we set, then you use our standard formatting, which means you don't want to have to worry about formatting, you just want it to be right. And so by providing an appropriate LaTeX style, we make sure that the document you create is right. Um, and you know, you can learn LaTeX in about 30 minutes. Um, so Overleaf give you a link here um, to learn LaTeX in, in LaTeX in 30 minutes. Um, you can do that. It actually is about that long. So you shouldn't worry too much that there's a massive learning curve. There is quite a bit to do at the beginning, but and in principle, if you understand this concept of a markup language, where you give the computer information about metadata about what you're saying, so that it can lay it out properly, then you know this picking up um, LaTeX is just a, a new syntax. So it's a markup language. Um, it uses this this container model for most of its things, where it has begin end, and so as you can see over here. Uh, for a particular frame that I'm displaying on the right, I have a begin end on um, in the text, uh, and so that gives me a, an option to to kind of create these blocks of things. In this case, a frame is a frame in the uh, in the um, PowerPoint slides, well, equivalent of PowerPoint slides. Um, so I'm just going to grab over that and see if there's anyone else. Uh, oh yeah, there's a couple of people in in Discord. I'll just go into the lecture. Oh. Yes, I should go into the lectures seeing I'm 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 online and I see that, that Ian has joined my oh that's comp three one three lectures. I should actually be in the comp three oh three lectures. So uh, I'll just go in there and tell Ian, if you move over to the comp three the Swin three oh three, that's where I'll actually be. Um so I'm I'm also running on Discord so that people can can connect with me. And I see yes, I see Ian, one of the other lecturers, is just popping in to say hello. Um and yep so see so yeah so we're just yep so yeah so that's that <laughs> that is that is Ian one of the other lecturers uh who just popped in to say hello and what I should do is you you heard him um I should actually make sure that the audio for my um discord is um 
actually going to the right place because at the moment that came out of my speakers which meant all of you heard it so I need to go ah okay so it did actually it was supposed to be going out through the road speakers um yeah okay um that should be fine okay so people who who pop into the um, scene 303 lecture can hear this as well okay so this idea that you have a frame and you have a content and style um separation one of the interesting things we find is that when you use a particular tool, the way, what it does natively influences the way that you think. Um, particularly, this is true of PowerPoint. Because PowerPoint has this default of a bullet-pointed list, almost everyone who uses PowerPoint to make their slides or Google Slides has this default concept of, oh, presentations are a title and a bunch of bullet points. Admittedly, that's what I'm doing here. Um, now, if you use a tool like Prezi, where it is much more focused on there being an image and then you moving to a new image or moving in, this idea of what's natural in that environment becomes what you do. So in LaTeX, what's natural is text. And so you do tend to find that LaTeX documents are text heavy because that's the nature of the, of the tool. If you wanted to do a visually heavy document, then you're probably going to use an Ad Adobe tool or a Word tool. You're going to use a tool that supports images as its primary way of interacting rather than text. So the tool that you use will influence the way in which you think, and that's quite important. So choosing your tool will actually help you if you want to write text as your goal choose a tool that naturally supports text. If you want to use images as your primary communication, pick a tool that defaults to images as its primary communication. So um, if you go to the next slide, so we're down here, um, formatting. So um, you're unlikely to be an expert. That's why we have these styles. Journals and conferences require their own style formats. And if you, are using Word, you have to do quite a lot of reformatting of your document to get it to the point where they're willing to use it. Now, some journals, you'll actually just submit the document and they will take your um, your text and copy and paste it into their existing Word format. It's a ridiculously manual process, takes a long time, and is, is you know, a very error-prone way of, of actually formatting documents. Uh, and so, like the web, we look at using things like CSS as a separation from HTML to style things in a different way. Um, and so if we look at, at citation formats, um, we also say that, that I want to cite things in particular ways. Now, some of you will have been burned by having been told to cite things in a particular way and been told, oh, you got this wrong. You put the author before the title or the you put the title um, and, and in the wrong place with the date. and uh, so so what LaTeX does is it basically takes all that away and says, no, 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 citations will tell you how they should be sorted out. Just use BibTeX. You give us all the information you, um, that could possibly be in a citation and tell us how it should look, and the computer will handle that for you. You don't need to worry about it, right? So, so it's this idea of separating content from from presentation even further uh, and you know there's there's also a bunch of formalized things that happen in standard document templates like appendices and references and abstracts and lists of figures and lists of tables and all of these additional structural elements that are around presentation those are included in the templates in LaTeX so so they, they help you get the formatting correct without having to worry about it too much um, so if we have a look at, at um, sharing documents as well, this is a uh, Overleaf template. Um, and, and I'm using Overleaf, which is an online tool uh, in, at NTNU. We've, uh, they've actually paid for every student to have access to Overleaf, so um, you guys can use this and share it. Uh, for my New Zealand students, uh, you can still use Overleaf, but you can only share it with one other person rather than a large team of people. Uh, now, that may be enough if you're just sharing an individual document, but you could look at using a professional overleaf account if you wanted to, to do collaborative editing. With the shared, with the sharing, 
um, up here, I'm able to do basically a Google Doc style of us simultaneously editing here, adding comments, having reviews, discussing the document. And so it gets that feeling of, of working together while being remote. Right? And that's one of the things that we particularly need at the moment, once we're in lockdown, is this idea of how do we do nicely formatted collaborative work. Word is a bit more challenging to do this in. You tend to do it in sending things back and forth with reviews. Here we can do it simultaneously. So it's a little bit easier than the Word documents for this style of, of collaboration. The nice thing about LaTeX is that it's all text. And so you never have any of those issues of binary files or the being the wrong format or, or not being able to see or process things because it works well with version control tools, it's easily shared, it's easily sent to other people, and it has instructions in it, it has the metadata attached to it that tells it how to be displayed and, and how to work. So uh, it has a, a, a nicer way of sharing the raw text and the editable version. If you want to just share the result, then you're sharing PDFs. It generates PDFs, so you can share those as well. Um, and the idea is that there, there is no, they, they try to avoid hidden content. Uh, if you've ever been editing Word, one of the things that does, that's really annoying, is that there's a bunch of codes in there that are hidden, that when you hit delete on the end of a line, suddenly all the formatting changes, because you deleted a formatting marker rather than just an end of line marker. There is none of that here. Everything is explicit. If you, if you haven't written it down, it's not in the document. Okay, so, so that's really nice about this is there isn't, there isn't secret, un, unviewable content. It is written down or it doesn't exist. Um, and you also can, um, I know although I'm only using a single file here, this example.tech, um, you can actually you write it in multiple files and then include those files. And this is fantastic for writing chapters. You'll find in our standard templates that there are often multiple chapters with .tex to say that they're LaTeX files. Okay, so, um, and, and this idea of, of your words express your thoughts and it's your thoughts that are important. So for our for our degrees, for computer science, for for um, the the degree in Norway, which is a, a game programming degree and a um, bachelor in programming degree, we actually care about what you think about, not the style in which you 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 think, right? So it's not the the, the style of your presentation. That's a secondary aspect. We are actually interested in your your understanding and the depth of thought you have rather than the prettiness of your presentation, which is why we provide you a LaTeX template and say, just make it look like that. That's how pretty we want it to be, like that. Just do it that way. And we can then ignore the style and see your real thoughts. And that's that's actually part of the core of why we, as a computer science department, ask you to provide us documents that are all in the same format. It allows us to look past the style and look past the formatting into your thought processes. And that's how we try and do the evaluation. Because if we everybody presents their documents in different ways and with different styles, it it can confuse our understanding and confuse our marking. Right? So that's and that's one of the things we want to avoid is we don't we don't want to grade people on on style. We want to grade them on substance. So um, if we move down to including files. Now, as you can see, um, I, if, if I want to go back to this site, I can just double click here and it will update that site, which is great because then you can see the LaTeX version and the displayed PDF version. Okay, so um, when I said you can include files, uh, it's actually relatively easy. You just use the slash include ink structure. So um, I've actually this this ink structure is uh, a this this would be a folder and a file called .txt underneath it, and I just use slash include. Now you see how I've actually got this grayed and slightly larger, um, or grayed out and in in a in a different font form um, format. This stuff. Well, actually, that's done in a LaTeX command up here, where I created this new gfcb um, command which creates the the um, a gray box around it and actually you can see it says you know gray flat colored box right so that's gfcb is gray flat color box um, and so I use a flat color box uh, I have a, uh, a white border 
there is basically no border and then gray at a particular value and I do a quad and I set that quad up around the text that I have that I send into the the new command right so this is how you can create your own formatting within um, the within LaTeX, right? So this is an example of doing a new command where I'm going to create a command. And if I, so if I go back to here, you can see I now use that command to go, oh, create this thing. One extra piece of information is to do that, I had to detokenize. Um, and that's a, a, a LaTeX command which will look at this thing inside it and say, well, actually, um, yeah, this would normally be special characters, so you need to remove the special characters, make them view visible, so that it doesn't get confused between what's a special character and what's my instructions to show something. So, so that's that's why it looks that large. Um, I could always detokenize these things, or I could make another command that was a code command. There are various ways you can change this description so that the content here is more understandable, but you know, at the moment, I'm I'm uh, I'm using that. I could change this these two to be um, code, and then say, oh, this is a special thing which is around. This is coded rather than formatting. Okay, so including text files, um, I just do a slash include, and then uh, I have a text file. This and I can have path included in there. Uh, it allows logical separation of content by having different files doing different things. Uh, and I can have files that do images, and I can have files that do graphics, and I can have files that are um, logs of things. So I can I can keep those all as separate files, and include them uh, in, a, in a a strategic way, rather than just dump them all in and have to comment them out if I don't want them in the document. Um, and you can see here I've added on this side a note um, so that people can. So when I was presenting, this would appear on that right-hand side. At the moment, I'm not presenting, so that note has just disappeared. You don't see it in the PDF that I've, I would print because it could be a note to myself while presenting. Okay, so um, if we have a look down here, um, so uh, it also allows us to only compile parts of our document. So very much like um, we do when we're coding and we have .h files and we have .o files where we compile parts of programs. Um, by commenting out include, you can actually remove whole chapters of a document. And so you're only printing out, you're only viewing some small parts of a document rather than the entire document. So that can, can help you organize things. Uh, and it also helps this idea of creating reusable content. So if I have a file which has something useful in it, I can include it and then that will appear uh, or take that file and use it somewhere else and it will appear there. So so this idea of, of, of code use and reuse, you can also see happening in um, LaTeX. So, okay, so I've, I've, so this is this is standard like, okay, so I've got a LaTeX file, uh, I can put text in it and you can see here I've, I've put text in, in itemizing and I've got a frame title here. Uh, how do I include images, right? and if you go and run the the at the beginning there, I said go and learn LaTeX in 30 minutes. You could go away and do that. It will show you how to do the basics of LaTeX. I'm kind of trying to extend that with some of the stuff we do specifically. So this is not a replacement for that tutorial. This is me talking about what we do and giving you some other view of it. So do the LaTeX tutorial. It's very useful to learn how to do standard LaTeX. This is as I said, some of the things we do to include images. So here, um, what we would normally do is you would include an image as a figure. Now, why do we do that? Well, because traditionally, in the way that we like to refer to images, is that when we're when we're publishing, right? When, when there's separation of content and presentation, when you publish something, sometimes an image won't fit exactly where it was supposed to be and then you know the publisher will go well actually the page is a bit narrower and so suddenly this this image is now at the end of a page uh, do i put it on the next page or do i put it at the top of the page or the bottom of the page or where do i put that image now if in text i say see image right the problem then is what if that image has moved from being on the right and now it's above or below right so that's kind of 
presentation specific content is really bad. So what we do is we actually put this in a um, in a figure and we say, right, this image has a figure and it's got a figure number and we refer to it as figure five. That is how we then can move that image around without it losing connection to the text that refers to it because we refer to the label of the image rather than the position of the image. Okay, so it's that different way of thinking. How do I refer to the content rather than the layout position? So that's why we have to number um, figures and refer to them. Um, and, you know, we include a caption and uh, that allows us to have a list of figures with the caption text and then the text underneath it is the full text that appears in the document. Um, and uh, if we go to there and that will update this side. So here uh, you can see that to get actually to put this image here, I had to do a wee bit of tricky things. Um, one is I've I've actually done this this first part of the itemized list separately for the second part of the itemized list. And um, I've done an H fill and I've raised the box um, so that I've actually moved this up here. And then I've used include graphics. Now include graphics is a standard LaTeX tool as part of the graphics. Um, there's a graphics library which we include at the top. I'll just go and show you that. Up here you can see that we do um, use package where is it? There's book tabs, uh, Babel, CSV simple, PDF pages, ink listings, Beamer format. Okay, so okay, I thought that we were including the graphics option. It may be included in the in the um, in our style format in the NTNU style. Um, which is the color theme. So um, we have a, a, a various includes here which show you the sorts of things we include, um, but I can't find the, the image thing. But include graphics is one of the, the standard ones that you'll be generally be able to use in most LaTeX formats. Okay, so including graphics. We've done a little bit of, of fudgery here where we said, okay, the width equals 0.2 times the text width. What that means is that this is 20% of the width of the full text area. So this is the 0.2, 20%. So it is a multiplier by the full text width to say how big this image should appear because that image is actually much larger. And so I've had to narrow it down. And I've included it and I've done the folder figures and then the name of the graphics. And that one is over here in figures um, you can see just under my head there, um, you can see that I have a PNG that is this this image. And that's how I've included that graphic. Okay, so relatively simple. Uh, where it gets included, that's a challenge. So this is why here I've had to do this, this interesting um, uh, workaround um, is to move it around and, and, and change the height uh, so I move it up and put it in the right place, right? So that's that's a wee bit of f f um, fiddling because this is not a standard figure that I'd be putting in a normal um, document. Okay, so uh, if we so for for normal document writing, all figures have to appear um, with text reference. So. One of the things you'll find that you will be criticized by by some academics is that if you include a figure and never refer to it anywhere in text, the problem is that that figure might then be put in some far away from anything you've written, right? Because it could be that all the images appear at the bottom after all the text. Without someone referring to it, I never know that it existed. I have no idea what it refers to and I have no idea why I should be looking at this figure, right? So that's why we say every time you use an image in a formal document, you should have a number associated with that and you re should refer to that number and that figure somewhere in your text so that the, the layout system knows where this is associated with. So if I need to place it somewhere, I can place it next to where it's talked about, right? So that's why Without that reference, we don't know where what is relevant um, to that particular image in terms of your text.
Okay, so um, citations. This is another big thing that we try and get students to do is cite things. So under citations, we use um, bib um, files. So here I've created um, the, the uh, bib file uh, is uh, the bibliographical file for a text. So here I have an example bib um, and under example bib you can see I've got lots of additional information. Uh, this is the beginner's guide to LaTeX um, with a URL which is just a web page which is why we use MISC and this is a full journal article uh, with a, ti um, a, a title and authors and um, volume number pages year and publisher right so it gives you though that um, full um, reference now how that appears depends on the format that LaTeX has been told to display it in so here I just given all the information uh, right at the end of this document um, and here I, this would be site Talo 2001 outcomes this is an um, ask wall 1995 this would be latex 2005 so these would be different ways of citing it now way at the bottom of the document here you can see that this this one um is the second article and outcomes natural control program in the ontario um, teaching hospital and the journal and the year and the pages so how this is laid out is not determined by me but in terms of this information provided it's determined by the bib system uh, that latex is using okay so if we go back to where we were um, so what we do is we also use and if i make sure that that's lined up um we use a bib file and we connect that bib file to the latex referencing uh, and i think i cite that here I show you an example of a citation um, and if I use it further down whether I actually use it I'm sure I cite it somewhere I must cite it somewhere else it wouldn't appear in the bibtech reference um, anyway I'll find that later so uh, so at NTNU we use two styles um, so some of the humanities um, use Vancouver um, uh, or some of them use Harvard and we use Vancouver um, so that determines how texts appear in the document whether they're a number or whether they're the long form with the author date and so we actually in, in our document we set a boolean so you could choose which one you used normally what you do is you you use the different bib style in LaTeX right now in New Zealand our ECS group have a single style so you just use the standard bib style that we suggest uh, in Norway, we're trying to have it adapt to two different uh, groups who wanted different citation styles. So you can still write your document, change this one bullion, and have it show all your citation cited references in a different way. Okay, so you can also use multiple bib files. Uh, I myself use multiple bib files. I have one for my neural network stuff, one that was my PhD stuff, one that might be a VR bib file. And so I have different subject areas with different texts in these bib files and so I just include them and then uh, extract from those the cited references I'm specifically using um, so here this is what a LaTeX file looks like now to a bib a bib tech entry looks like now to get that bib tech uh, where do you get the bib tech file well uh, and there's a couple of ways the one of the standard ways is to go somewhere like Google Scholar uh, if you ever use Google Scholar, uh, and to look up, say, um, well, um, let's see if I search myself, do I find any articles that, yeah, gamification and serious games for personalized health. This is one of my articles that I wrote. wrote. Um, and you can see you've, I've cited by 300 people. But if I want to get this, I can cite it, and it says, oh, you've got these formats. But the, class, the, the one that you're actually interested in is this one down here, BibTech. I do that I can then copy that bibtech and put it into and if I go back to my overleaf um, and I go into my example I can just paste that in there and now I have a citable link here uh, and if I want to actually cite it in my document uh, I could go back to here 
and I could say, okay, this is a citation. So if I said, well, actually, um, ID in the bib file, I could go sesh site colon. And here you can see now, because this is all linked and, and um, Overleaf is doing its job, it now knows that I've got this, this specific name, McCallum 2012 Gamification, and I can click that in. And now when I recompile, um, it also has an automatic recompile that will happen after a set length of time. But if we recompile it now, let's see if that actually worked. And see what it does. I haven't actually seen what that does. I'm not sure if it do anything. Um, aha, there we go. One. Um, so that is, I, I just added that citation, um, and you can see that's actually even even clickable when because because this PDF will take me straight to that citation. So um, so that allows me to to navigate directly to the citation. Now you can see. I have a laid out citation in my, my document um, that I just added by going to Google Scholar. Uh, I didn't have to do any of those other steps of kind of trying to work out what things are. Okay, so that's a, that's a simple way of, of doing um, um, uh, a download. A more complex way and uh, one that you might like to use is um, ah, Web of Science. So Web of Knowledge, I think they are now. Um, so this is a, a database, uh, the Web of Science, Web of Knowledge, uh, is a database which requires you to log in or to be a, an affiliated organization. Um, now, if you're inside NTNU's um, VPN, so if you're using NTNU's VPN or you're using um, VIX VPN, you can get access to Web of Science and actually view these databases and you can download references using um, using BibTech format. So it will actually download in BibTech and you can then just copy and paste it in. And one of the things I like to do is add abstracts, but um, we can show you that at another time. I'll just get back to um, the the Beamer presentation. So so sometimes it's useful to have in your .bib file is to add um, an abstract. So here I didn't have any additional information. One of the things I'll often do is I can add um, uh, abstract and you, because sometimes it's useful to be able to search for the abstract in your bib file. And so if you actually have a look at the scoop, Google Scholar and I go back um, in here, you can see that it will, um, if, I, if I click on that, It'll generally take me somewhere which will give me, oh, it actually took me to the thing. I can find the abstract uh, and, oh, it's, uh, that's really good. So um, it's actually able to give me the full PDF. So, um, but here, this is the abstract. So if I go continue reading, and I grab that, I could copy that abstract because the abstracts are, are um, generally always um, public because they you can't find out about the file without them. So I would go in here and I would paste the abstract in here. Now, the advantage of that is if I'm looking, if I've got a really big file of bib, bib, bibliographical articles, this gives me basically text search in here for words that are related to a particular issue or an article that might not be in their header, right? So it's just a, 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 an easy way of adding um, information. And you can also, now you don't add notes, you, add, you if you go annote, um, basically that's not part of the LaTeX standard, and so it won't um, draw that. But here I could also add my notes to the, um, this is my paper from, 2012. Now that won't appear anywhere, right? So if I recompile, neither of these two will, the abstract and the anote won't appear in the document here because they're not part of the standard bib format. Uh, and so when I go to the end here, you see that I've still got just the standard reference that I had before. But it means that in my documentation, I've got these pieces of additional information which I can use. Okay, so that's that's the way I use bib files, and it's it can be really useful if you're trying to keep things organized. Okay, so um, 
Okay. Um, right, so, uh, and here, so if we keep going down, so um, they'll move on to talking about charts. Um, so I'm taking a bit longer than I intended to, but um, okay, so we're talking about charts here. So uh, that's citations, charts. Um, okay. <laughs> Microsoft Teams is bleeping at me. Um, so if you're going to include graphics and charts, then there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is to include, um, <laughs> I have to turn off notifications. Um, one of them is to include the um, charts as, as just straight graphics. It's a fairly standard way of doing it. You create the graphic using uh, Excel or anything other tool, and then you um, uh, just include it as a graphics uh, uh, item. Generally, that's a little bit ugly, so we, we prefer to actually see if we can use things like GNU plot or R to create graphics which are vector graphics rather than raster graphics. So rather than being an image with pixels, this is the description of the lines. And so that can be much higher resolution. It prints m in a much prettier way. And so uh, I use GNU plot myself. Uh, a number of, of the students use R to generate their, their plots, and they can generate vector plots. So um, and, and there are even options to have them generate in line in LaTeX uh, if you don't care too much about your compiling time and you're willing to generate the graphic on the fly. Um, this is okay if you've only got a few of them. If you start having large numbers of images that you're generating at compile time, your compile time gets very long. So um, we can create them from CSV files, and I show you some examples of being able to do that uh, in a sec. Uh, and if you have a large number of graphics that are relatively similar, it is quite nice to be able to include those in a make file that, that will generate and update those figures from your latest data. So charts are and figures are very important. I have a whole seminar on data visualization that I do with my postgrads, and if you're keen, we can look at doing something that with that later. Um, here is an example of a plot. This plot is generated from a graphic. Um, and uh, yeah, actually, so so this has got a, a kind of a, an image plot here. You can see this, this figures GPN is actually this file. Uh, this has been generated as I did not write this file. As you can see, you would never write this file. But this is generated by GNU plot as a LaTeX picture. Um, and so this is, it basically describes all the lines. And, but you can see some interesting things here where it sort of has the, it puts on, the, it puts a few short lines at various places. Uh, and way up the top here, you see that it, um, it does begin picture and then it puts all of these things in and, and, and puts all the boxes. It's basically doing that job there, right? It is, it is generating this internal. Um, and uh, here, if I find where I can say, ah, yes, in the middle here, you can see these are actually the, um, where it says uh, y equals, so test of y equals sine x, that's the text that is this text up here, right? So that, that text is this text. So, so you can actually see the LaTeX text in the LaTeX image, right? So this is why it's able to do interesting things with the math format and actually keep the, the format of the maths in the figure the same as the format of the maths um, in the rest of the document. Whereas if you make a, a picture from Excel, it's much harder to keep that consistency. So uh, here, and you can see here, I'm actually referring to this as a figure. Um, and so I actually have begin figure and I this is a, a a document about how to use it. Um, I also scale it to make it fit, and I give it a caption uh, with a, a short version, and then the full version which will appear underneath. Okay, so that's that's a general figure representation that you'll see when you're including a graphic in LaTeX. Um, this was generated by GNU plot. There are lots of other ways you can, as I said, generate a PDF. So um, if we have a look at code listing, something the, another thing we do in computer science a lot is we list code. Um, this is a uh, uh, the, the using the list LST list listings package. 
Uh, so that's included up above as an include. Uh, I can actually show you that because I did see that before. So here, use package listings, right? That's that's the actual document that tells LaTeX how to use this particular formatting area. So formatting type. So if we go to that, um, oh, take me to the listings. Um, ah, we're here. So. As part of that, I've centered it and I've said, right, okay, what I want to do, and I've, I've called it a figure, right? So I've, I've wrapped it in, in the beginning figure. I've told that figure to center. I've told it what kind of language this is, and this is going to be Python. And then I've given a list of begin listings, and I've just put the code in here and then ended the listing, okay? So this is a, the, the standard way of including a listing in LaTeX. Now, we can also include a whole bunch of ways of putting borders around it and changing its color and changing its format and all those sort of things can be done. But uh, this is the simple way of having a listing. And it means you can create lists of listings and you can, can do a whole bunch of nice things. But if you make your code listing separate from your, your normal text, it makes it much easier for, to, to lay that out in specific ways. So... Um, we're getting on um, in time. I, I should have stopped this much earlier. But uh, okay, so here we go with, with math. Of course, this is where LaTeX beats almost everything else is in math's representation. So if you have anything where you need to do math, then um, LaTeX probably is, is the tool of choice. So here you can see this is a formula uh, and I can create equations and I give the equation a label which then allows me to cite that label, right? So uh, by using the slash ref, and refs and labels are match, right? So re ref referring to this label will give me the equation number one, right? Now, that's because if I add new equations, they'll get renumbered. And so you don't want to refer to the static number one, you want to use a label and a ref. And it's the same for figures. With figures, you put in a label, and then you put a ref, right? And that will give you numbers that you can that will appear in your document and be constantly updated. Okay, so here, um, this is standard LaTeX math. If you want to learn about LaTeX math, you can go and read about LaTeX math. It is it generates the proper mathematical symbols in from a fairly complex looking markup, but it is is uh, an editable markup. Okay, so. Uh, the last couple of things that I was going to show are table formats. Tables are really, really, really annoying in LaTeX. Um, and that's because uh, they they require a lot of, of slashes and vertical bars and it just it looks ugly. Uh, so one of the things that I use is uh, I actually use book tables. Uh, and by using book tables, I can actually generate tables that look like this. As you can see here, we do... Um, CSV auto ta um, book tabular and I just grab that from a CSV file and that CSV file is honestly well, no preview because it's it's just a text file right so it's just a CSV file um, with uh, in this case if I go back to the example deck uh, in this case what it is is it's age comma IQ end line 10 comma 100 10, 20 comma right so it, it gives you a a, a simple format um, that you can then rather than having that text in the document you have it as a separate file and you can refer to the raw file and show it in the table right and it means that it, again it's even more emphasizing content versus versus presentation uh, and so that's one of the things I use um, there are various other tools out there that you can create LaTeX tables um, but they are a bit of a hassle. Uh, okay, so uh, where there are other formats like the proof format where you have a theorem and a begin and end proof and they generate a different look in in a document. So those are the, the, that's a kind of example of, of I haven't talked about blue square and light blue or anything like that. I've just said, oh, use the theorem format, right? Uh, now, if we've asked you to do theorems and we've provided you a theorem format, that's the format you should use. Uh, we have a thesis template, um, and this template itself is at GitHub COP CSE, which is a community of practice for computer science education, minus NTNU, which is the, my Norwegian university. Uh, and we actually have a bunch of the master's thesis and bachelor thesis in this Beamer template there, uh, as well as a poster template. Um, 
And we're looking at providing an Inspira and a non-Inspira version. At the moment, those are being updated with us starting to use Inspira. Um, we'll see how that goes. It also includes things like, you know, being able to do C++ as a Wii macro, where I do slash C++. Uh, and also the to do and the com macros, which allows you to add to do's to your document, which come up in a different color and comments from me, from someone like me, like lecturer slash com, where I'm commenting about the document, which you can then fix later. Um, here you can see I've commented out a whole section. So that then doesn't appear here and I can go straight to tools. Um, so the tools that I've used here are Overleaf, which you're currently watching. I use Jabref, which is a Java based um, tool for uh, providing an overview of BibTeX files. Um, I used Google Scholar. You can also use Web of Knowledge to extract things. Uh, I use GNU Plot, which I can show in another video. Uh, um, we can use Doxygen, which will generate LaTeX documentation. Uh, I use new commands uh, to allow myself my own formatting and creating my own text. And uh, I can use Pimpress as a way of visualizing and displaying a PDF document uh, as a PowerPoint presentation. And one of the nice things about Pimpress and linked to LaTeX is that I can have the notes on the right and it will show me a nice way of viewing the document um, in that full format. So so if I go, um, oh, well, I'll need to, uh, I can show you Pimpress another time. Okay, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, if you have any questions, email me. Uh, and I'll do a follow-up video uh, for anybody who has questions about these tools and, and um, this presentation. Okay, thank you.